to another episode. This is Alex Muir, helping millennial professionals reach peak mental and physical performance. And in today's episode, um, this, this episode is brought to you by uh, RadioGuestList.com, the number one free radio guest podcast and talk show guest, guest expert interview booking service on the internet. And in today's episode, I got a special guest today, Brandon Amoroso. Brandon is the, is the founder or CEO of Electric Marketing or electric with an IQ at the end, marketing. And he's uh, been the CEO since March, 2018, while he attended uh, the University of Southern California. The goal of electric marketing is helping businesses grow their digital footprint and acquire new customers. Brandon has a significant e-commerce marketing ability from his extensive work experience with platforms such as Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Instagram. And in his past role at drinks.com, Brandon was responsible for building over seven different brands, on a variety of media platforms, growing customer engagement by more than 150% across all brands, lowering CPA costs by 42%. Brandon is knowledgeable in startup marketing from running SEO audits, creating innovative content campaigns, and generating national media buzz to providing insights through Google Google Analytics and target ad buy campaigns. Brandon is always looking forward, or looking for what small changes have the power to improve your business. And Brandon, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to, uh, I had a, definitely had a few questions for you. And I'm really excited about this episode to have you on because uh, it's an honor to have you on because I'm actually someone that's been very interested in digital marketing over the last few years. And I've slowly been um, learning from a few of my close colleagues about it. But I really wanted to learn from someone that has, you know, has their own business um, and has that experience with, you know, with clients and with, um, just kind of how things are going right now in 2020 and beyond with the digital marketing space. Mm-hmm. And one of the uh, questions that I wanted to ask you was um, that I had written down as well is where do you see um, digital marketing going or e-commerce uh, 2020 and beyond? So I think you're going to see a huge progression to online shopping, even more so than we've seen in the past couple of years. Um, this whole the whole incident and pan- national pandemic going on right now with the with the virus is forcing uh, people to reevaluate how they consume. And so you're seeing in industries that have typically been entrenched in retail, for example, like wine, that are experiencing ever increasing volumes through their online platforms in the past couple of weeks. And even when the pandemic is over, it's not like everybody who just started to purchase online is going to immediately go back to their old habits. Um, so I see e-commerce growing exponentially in the next couple of years, irregardless of if this whole ordeal went on with the, with the virus. But this is just pushing it further and further in that direction, in my opinion. Gotcha. Yeah, it's definitely I've noticed it definitely a major push for online, um, especially with, you know, everyone applying for EI, getting laid off their jobs. And, you know, a lot of people right now, they might not have, not have, not have access to certain businesses or grocery stores, but they definitely have access to an internet connection. Yeah. And that's providing a lot more um, options for people nowadays. Yeah. It's really, it's really crazy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like another thing I want to mention to you was um, like, as far as you're, you're, you know, dealing with uh, new startups and and clients that are, you know, uh, they got, they got a brand new brand that they're building. They have a little bit of a digital presence or social media um, presence online, but they, they don't yet have a large enough following. Um, what is your what is your process for uh, helping a, a client or a new startup right out of the gate? And they said they want to build a following. They want to build that that reputation, and that influence. How do you um, how do you help them start? Yeah, so we typically when working with uh, startups, we like to focus on all of their inbound channels. So the advertising, the email. Um, social media and also SEO and we have like a content philosophy here where we'll we'll create a piece of content and then it's able to be repurposed for all four of those aforementioned channels so that way you're cutting down on your costs and you're becoming more efficient with the content that you're creating so we don't hyper focus on social media for any of our startup clients because it's not going to give them the greatest bang for their buck Um, some like small tips and tricks we'll use to increase their social following though, or like the standard giveaways or partnering with another brand. Um, you can enter into sweepstakes with uh, certain companies where you essentially pull together your email list with 
five to ten other brands and people enter to win like a trip to Bahamas or something like that. Um, there's a ton of like interesting ways that you can grow the actual following on social media. Um, but the most cost effective way for a startup is to utilize some sort of a platform where they able, where they're able to create content and then repurpose it for all four of their channels. Because there's no point in creating something only for social when you could create something that's a blog post that then can be repurposed for social, go out to your email list, and then you could even run it, uh, run an advertising campaign around it. Yeah, that, that was something that I've um, been learning about myself, actually, because I got my own blog and it took me about eight, eight months to build because I'm not super tech savvy, but I definitely have a passion for it. And, um, and then what I've been learning is like, I've just been trying to take that same blog post and then repurpose it, use it for YouTube, use it for Instagram. Yep. Um, and then, yeah. And then I'll use a lot of the same content for my podcast episodes as well. So I've been kind of utilizing that same strategy. Cause I'm like, I understand that you got to do or what they, what I, from what I've heard, you have to try and tailor that content that you make for that platform. But I just, I just prefer recycling that content kind of making evergreen and, reusing it and it's the same message it's just across a different platform right yeah i mean as long as it's good content like that's the first and foremost you have to make sure that it's valuable content um but if it if you get that part down then there's no reason why you can't use it on all of your channel right right okay yeah that's awesome i mean the, the whole and thing then, with startups um... is trying to get trying to be able to create efficiencies that would not be possible without technology so like when you're a startup you only have a few people at most to actually execute on all the ideas and initiatives that you have so you need to be able to effectively use um, your time so that you can do the work of many when it's just one of you so that's why we focus so much on like marketing automation with a lot of our startup clients because we want to set up these processes at the get-go so that once we start to fill their their lead funnel and to build out their CRM that we actually have like a welcome series set up that we have all these standard automated workflows set up so that there's not as much manual work that has to be done by uh, the, the client. Right, right. And what kind of automation software do you use for your clients? So we typically use uh, HubSpot. That's been pretty successful for us um, over the last year. We have been expanding our relationship a lot with them um because it allows us to focus on all four of those inbound channels and then there's a centralized crm that all of the data gets fed into and then from there you can set up all of your email triggered um, marketing automation workflows and sort of our ideal client is somebody who's on shopify and who is willing to use hubspot because for most startups in the e-commerce space if you have hubspot and you have shopify you don't really need anything else so it allows you to not have a crazy marketing tech stack where you're working with like 20 different tools and you can't get them to talk because you don't have the API integration set up. When you have the Shopify HubSpot, sort of, it's, it's got an out-of-the-box native integration, so you don't have to do any of the coding. And the two systems talk to each other, and then they both have robust app marketplaces. So it has everything a small business could possibly need. Um, so that's always a recommendation for any startup that we work with, because then it makes things simple and it allows us to actually execute on our ideas as opposed to trying to figure out how can we do this. Yeah, yeah, because that's one big thing that I've noticed is like, because I have my blog with with a WordPress. Um, but again, like you said, sometimes certain things to make work on WordPress, you need to learn how to code. And if I don't know how to do yeah. that, it, you know, then I'm just like, well, like whether it be, you know, trying to integrate um, MailChimp or like a need to do email campaigns or stuff like that. Like certain things work, but certain things don't because you have to be more tech savvy. For, yeah. And then uh, things are constantly, uh, marketing things are tactics. constantly breaking too. Like my, my, uh, my blog is on WordPress as well. Um, and I'm actually going to get, get it off of it pretty soon and probably move it over to Webflow or to the HubSpot CMS. Um, Webflow is really neat. If you've never looked at it before, it's, basically a website design tool for um, not only for coders but for like graphic design artists and for just regular people with no technology experience as well like like myself so it's a lot of drag and drop functionality um, so you should give that a look if you're if you're interested um, it's been that's what oh, we built sure. our website on and I 
had no coding experience when I graduated um, 10 months ago, but just through going through that process of building the website, um, I picked up a decent amount of, of, of coding ability. And I think for me, based on what I've seen, you don't really need to know code if you're not going to be in the back end, like a back end engineer. Um, you can get away now, especially today, with all the no code no code tools that are out there. If you have like a fundamental understanding of what's going on, you can make like slight modifications in the code, and then you can be perfectly fine. Um, I mean, that's how we've yeah, we've yeah. been able to design Shopify sites and Webflow sites with definitely not an advanced knowledge of um, anything like HTML or CSS or JavaScript. But it's all so out of the box now that that's what I try to stress and emphasize with, with new clients, especially startups is you don't have to go get something like custom built or some custom solution. There's so many templates out there that are allow are going to allow you to be super effective from the get go. There's no point in trying to waste your time with like a custom solution. Gotcha. Gotcha. And another thing, um, yeah, I was reading in your bio here, uh, for your previous role at drinks.com. It says that you were responsible for building seven different brands on their media platforms there. What, what, do, they, what do they mean yeah, by so that? Yeah, so drinks.com is a, it's a technology business. Um, they basically power uh, grocers or anybody really to ship wine direct to the consumer. And so they have their own proprietary brands. So when they started originally in 2013, they had a ton of brands. They had like Afternoon Delight. They had Barclays Wine. They had Heartwood and Oak. They had Wine Insiders. Um, so I was responsible for all of those. But over the time, we've consolidated it into just one. And so it's now WineInsiders.com. Um, and so we still work, we still work oh, with okay. them. Um, we're still responsible for Wine Insiders social media, uh, content creation. We built out their entire Wine 101 education series. So it's basically an organic traffic hub for their website, ranking for all the possible uh, wine varietals you could think of um, because it didn't make sense to have a bunch of scattered brands when they weren't super different. Um, it was just a lot of like extra creative lift that wasn't necessary. Uh, and then they also power Martha Stewart Wine, which were responsible for the social media um, for them as well and for the content. And then they also power Kroger and Boxed. Uh, their wine programs. Wow, that's incredible! So it's like it's like it's like uh, Hello Fresh or Skip the Dishes yeah, for wine. Yeah, a little bit. They they call it uh, <laughs> they call it WAS. So wine as a service instead of software as a service. Ah, yeah, that's that's cute. Cute little uh, ch name change there. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and that's like that's another thing. Um, from what I've seen over the last couple of years here, I don't know if you're, you know, you, you see it as well, probably a lot. Cause you're, you're, you're from, uh, Los I'm Angeles, from the right? suburbs of Chicago. So Barrington suburbs of Chicago. Oh, okay. But you're, but you're living. Yeah, on Los Angeles, correct. So. We're actually going to, we were supposed to oh, yeah. right open on. up a new office in San Diego, uh, early May, but I'm not really sure what's happening with that now, just based on the, the climate yeah. that we're in. Not sure if I'm going to be yeah. okay. Yeah, get somebody to move our stuff down there in May. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's gonna everything's now gonna have to be still yeah. virtual move, yeah. right? <laughs> so I'll probably be in LA for yeah. a little bit yeah. longer, but um, eventually we'll be in LA and San Diego, and then hopefully we'll continue to expand. That's awesome. And um, for for like Google and Amazon and and, and all them, are you are you still doing uh, like e commerce work for them and Facebook and Instagram? So. I've never worked for any of those companies. Um, we've only done, like, we help our clients activate on Amazon or activate, like, Facebook or Instagram. Oh, yeah, I see exactly. what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, so it's still, still working with all of them in that sense, but Amazon is a beast of its own. Um, yeah. Oh, no, definitely. But, yeah, but as far as, oh, yeah, that was what I was going to mention. Um, like, like, like when you're talking about e-commerce and how like this online shopping wave, um, like, cause I'm seeing just nonstop subscription service for, for food, like, like the, um, this, the Uber eats, yeah. skip the dishes. Um, there's one more, 
uh, what is it? Drive Dash or DoorDash? Whatever. There's DoorDash. Or DoorDash. Starbucks, yeah, yeah. Caviar. There's HelloFresh. Postmates. There's just so yeah. many. And then like, yeah, in, in the U.S., I bet there's way more. Like, there's a few in Canada that we have, but, um, but yeah, but there's there's a ton. And I'm just noticing, like, and then yeah, like, um, there's there's just going to be a lot more stores that become kind of like the way I see it, kind of like boutiques. Yeah. They're still going to have, you're still going to be able to see, go in to see the products, but it's going to be virtual all on a screen. And then, and then you can just, you can order them right then there, but they won't store any inventory because the way the business climate is nowadays, or from what I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that's going to happen is the, um, yeah, it's going to be all virtual. There'll be shopping malls, but they'll be, they'll be way smaller because they just don't need the space because they don't store any of the Yeah, I mean, if product, you can manage right? your inventory it's in all... a few central places, then you're going to cut down on a lot of waste. Yeah. As well because I know if you have like yeah. 500 stores, then you got to have X amount of product in each one. And so naturally you're going to end up with a yeah. ton left over as opposed to online, you're able to better calculate like the demand and you can forecast all that out. And it's just way easier to manage than having to manage. It's to track. You need, you need those yeah. metrics. Yeah. 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 And that, that's why that's another reason why, why I wanted to yeah, learn some more about digital marketing from you because like, I find it fascinating how, how much you can track. And I still got, I still got a lot to learn about the Google analytics, but um, for my blog and such, but the SEO I'm really yeah. trying to learn because like I'm sitting at uh, 15 to 30 users mm -hmm. a month or so. So it's small. But I know I have lots of room to grow. It's just it's a it, it takes time with the the content creation, right? Because that's yeah, I'm trying I mean, to build up my brand. So for me, is secondary. The first and foremost important thing is getting backlinks to your website. So getting earned media press, like that's what we do with all of our clients is get them into like gift guides, get them reviews written about them. It doesn't even have to be like large pub publications. It's not like we're getting placement in Forbes. We're getting placement in and so there's a score we use. It's the Moz domain rank. And so that's one to 100 of basically your, your site's ability to rank versus any others for a given keyword. So of the one to 100, if you look at like Nike, for example, um, they're going to be a 90. And then if you look at some of the smaller brands, they'll be around like a 20 to 30. And that's primarily a function of the number of backlinks going to your website. So if you're a brand new website and you don't get any press or any media and you, you could have the greatest content in the world, but it's not going to show up in the search results because nobody else is linking to your website. And that's one of the top three most important ranking factors in Google is the number and the quality of backlinks that you have to your site. So, so, so we okay. use things like help a reporter out uh, through Cision. Um, and then we manage and track all of our outreach in HubSpot so that we make sure we're not only getting press for ourselves, but for all of our clients as well. And things like gift guides, blogger reviews, it can even be mom and pop blogs, uh, anything that is of at least a decent quality is, is beneficial. Okay. So, so you're, you're recommending, so by backlinks, like any kind of publicity. Yeah. Press so that reviews. actual link though, in the press itself. So it might be on different anchor keywords, but for example, for you, it would be like, if you got, if you got press in a local magazine on their website, they would say, Oh, like you can visit Alex's site here. And then that's where they'd put the link. And so then when, when Google crawls uh, their okay. website, yeah. they see that link going to yours. And so they pass, basically what's happening is they're passing some of their domain authority over to you. Right. Okay. So it's getting the yeah, mentions exactly. on their site. So that's why brands like Nike have such okay, a yeah. high score because they have placements in all the places you could possibly imagine, like Forbes and everything else. Um, so it's like, it's like your own brand placement by uh, yep. word of mouth by these other um yeah okay influencers yep. or, or business people no that's good to know because i because i was definitely thinking about it all wrong because i thought it was you know I, I mean i get that it was like sharing it as much as you can um on you know i, I was in the beginning i was sharing it all on social but again that's not really going to do anything unless there's someone of influence yeah, I mean, on all, social all that, that stuff have, matters but I'm when it comes with, down right? to when somebody searches a keyword on google 
the vast majority of sites that are showing up on the first page are ones with high domain authority. And you get that high domain authority by getting backlinks to your website. So, for example, we just brought on gotcha. a new client who is like a 55 out of 100, which is super high. Like Nike, the 90 out of 100, that's crazy. That's not like realistic. It's all relative. So anybody above a 30, that's a good score. Like Wine Insiders, for example, is around a 37. And we're ranking for keywords like Montepulciano wine on the first page, which have like 12,000 searches a month. So 30, 30 or higher is perfectly fine. But we just brought on a new client who's about a 54 but they have no content whatsoever. But I know based on their score that as soon as we get that content up and as soon as it's indexed, indexed by Google, it's going to start ranking really high. Whereas if it was the flip, the alternative, which is a brand new startup that has a lot of content, but no backlinks. So they have a low domain score. That's going to be our number one focus is getting more backlinks to the website. Gotcha. And then for someone like myself, if I'm building my brand and I do have a, you know, my, on, my online marketing out there, all my social platforms on my blog, can I also use this Moz uh, site to, yeah, so to see how my it's site a, ranks? It's a free my domain. Like the, it's a paid tool. Um, the big SEO tools are SEMrush, IREFs, and Moz. We use SEMrush primarily, but I like Moz because it has a Chrome plugin in the top nav bar that will show you that score. So if you just go to Moz and you create a free account, then you can get that domain authority to show up there. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, Chrome Chrome has some great plugins. Other than the fact yeah, that so it much... destroys the RAM on your computer, um, they, they have some <laughs> yeah, great yeah. Um, what's what's your uh, thoughts on uh, the Brave browser? Like, I I've been using that just because it is so much faster. Because yeah, because Chrome. I mean, I love Chrome, but yeah, like yeah, you what, said, it is it a RAM hog. So, oh, uh, it's called Brave. Um, I listen to Tim okay. Ferriss' podcast all the time and because and he does so much writing and in his in his uh you know his his links and stuff crash all the time or his or his tabs because he's doing so much writing and like Chrome it it would crash all the time for him. So he he recommended Brave because mm -hmm. it's a free web browser. So it's pretty much identical to Chrome. It just uses like way less RAM and it blocks a bunch yeah, of Yeah, I'm taking a look at it right now. I might have to I might have to try it. The issue is I'm so like I'm so hooked into yeah, the Google yeah. ecosystem. It's sort of like how... Oh, I know. I know, I know. Like the Mac ecosystem. So like Apple and Google really, really have me. Because we're like, we're on we're on G Suite. Oh, like, yeah. Use Google. So like if I yeah. if I don't use Chrome, it's like... Oh, oh no, I know. I, and yeah. then like the Hub, the HubSpot plug... You, you feel so lost. My outreach yeah. and one-to-one -one communication that's on Chrome. So it's just like, they, they really get you there. Yeah. Yeah. And I definitely, I definitely don't know enough about HubSpot. I read a little bit about it. I think I've been on their site, but I still don't fully understand it. So you said from what, from my research, it's, it's a lot of like CRM management, like all in one automation. Yeah. So it's an all in one efforts, right? uh, inbound marketing software essentially. And they have three distinct okay. services. So they have, it's, if you think about it as like a circle in the middle that's the HubSpot CRM. And then there's three um, sort of third circles around that circle. Uh, one's the marketing hub, one's the sales hub, and one's the service hub. So all three of those hubs tie directly into the HubSpot CRM. So service hub is pretty self-explanatory. That's like a Zendesk. Uh, sales hub is like a Salesforce. And marketing hub is like any of the other inbound marketing softwares out there, like a Pardot. Um, so, and they all funnel into the HubSpot CRM and you don't need to use every hub. Like we only use the marketing hub and a starter version of the sales hub. We don't touch the service hub because we don't have any need for customer support like that. Um, and our biggest focus is on the marketing hub side of things, obviously. And it allows you to basically control like your blog, landing pages, social media, your content strategy, your SEO, your advertising and make it so that you're converting and nurturing all your leads in one centralized system. So like you can have the live chat, you can have forms, you can do AB testing, the conversational bots, uh, dynamic content. So like smart content. So if you go to my website, you're going to see something different than somebody else would based on your contact 
uh, profile or based on like where you're visiting from. If you're visiting from, from Canada versus visiting from the U S and then you also set up all your, all your automated workflows in there as well. Uh, so things like your welcome series, your browse abandon, your 90 day laps, um, abandoned cart, all of that, that can be done within, within HubSpot. Um, and the nice thing about it is that it has a large app marketplace, like roughly 330, I want to say. So, for example, we are beginning to work with a lot of uh, B2B businesses, and they are all in on Salesforce. So HubSpot's marketing hub directly integrates with Salesforce. So the handoff is seamless, and you're basically tying out your marketing to sales handoff in a way that wasn't possible before. Um, does that help a little bit? If you no, definitely. If yeah. you just Google yeah, that, that, why go HubSpot, the first result is going to be uh, HubSpot.com slash why go HubSpot, and that walks you through uh, everything for the for the most part. Gives you a high level on the marketing, the sales, the service, and and the CRM. No, for sure, because like I'm always trying to learn how can I how can I automate more of my sales process and my marketing efforts? Because before in the past, like I've been kind of, you know, dipping my toes in online marketing for the last three years and I've been learning a lot. I started off with yeah. um, YouTube and Facebook and first YouTube tried that for a bit. saw a little bit of, you know, uh, my best video got 788 views, but I'm still, you know, still got a lot to learn because YouTube's like a beast, just like uh, anything else. And then I went to Facebook ads and I tried that for a bit. Didn't see any really, cause I was doing affiliate marketing mm -hmm. through it to try and see if I could generate some leads. Good learning experience, but I didn't again, see any sort of success with it. And then I always wanted to build a blog. So then a couple yeah, a couple of years later, build the blog and been doing that. And then just keeping it with the blog podcast and um, YouTube. Yeah. And just cause, for for my brand, uh, like I let I, I want to help millennial professionals mm -hmm. with their reach peak mental and physical performance, and so it's like it's like psychology and and physiology like in conjunction with one another because I always feel like a lot of these personal trainers and stuff you know they could be really good they they do offer a lot of good advice like you know physically but where people struggle is they, their their head's not right their psychology isn't right and if your psychology is not right you won't be able to um, reach that level physically. Right. You need to, it, it, they, they both go together. Just like you know, your marketing and advertising and content generation go together. Yeah, I so. agree. Yeah, yeah. But uh, no, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense for the HubSpot. And uh, what's some other questions I want to ask you? I got, I got a ton. Um, um, let's see here. Hmm. Oh yeah, and I think I already mentioned it a little earlier, but I'll, I'll ask it again probably. Um, what what's been working for your clients um, in the digital marketing space so far? Like what what, what have you what have you what have you been seeing that's been working really well for them based on yeah. you know the, the process? I mean, that, email marketing like is the, still the number yeah. one way to communicate with your customers. <laughs> so everything we do from an inbound perspective mm -hmm. is to try and get that email so that we can start communicating with them on a quote unquote one to one basis through through our email uh, workflows and through any like pr pr promotional sends that we we send out um, a few things that have been working well recently as well are uh, exit pop-ups based on a contacts behavior on the website so let's say you're viewing a product page but then you go to exit out of the website but automatically HubSpot will generate a pop-up that says wait like hold on here's 15 percent off to go and complete your purchase and so we've seen really good results with that. And then also if they take the coupon, but they don't use it, then they'll get an email two days later saying, hey, like you still haven't used your coupon, go use it. Um, so that's been really helpful in terms of driving sales. Uh, as far as advertising, what's been working really well for us is video. So typically what we'll do is we'll set up a, a traffic ad in Facebook and uh, use a video for it under 15 to 20 seconds because people's attention spans are short. And then we will drive them to a landing page that has another video on it. Um, and that's sort of the traffic generation campaign, which is more top of the funnel. Uh, we've been seeing really good results with that, especially with the video. Um, if you can create an engaging video, the time on site we've seen has skyrocketed. The number of pages, 
our advertising visitors are going to is skyrocketing. Um, and then we have a retargeting campaign that is using a collection of products. So like when you go to Facebook and you're creating your ad campaign, if you select you want to do it for conversions, you have the option to create a collection in Facebook. And so we'll do a collection with the video. Um, and it's easier to see if you're doing it in, in, in the Facebook advertising platform. But essentially, what it allows you to do is to have your product shoppable on Facebook. And so we'll also add an instant experience on there. So I don't know if you've ever been on Facebook and you go to an ad on your phone and then you go to click through to it, but then it just opens up another page within Facebook where it's like a, a standalone shopping page designed by Facebook that's pulling in your product feed from, from your Facebook shop. That has been really helpful to increase mobile conversion rates because it's right. reducing the friction that a potential customer has to deal with. And then they're even able to add the cart within that Facebook instant experience. Wow. Now, this uh, standalone page, like product page, that, so you Facebook create, generates you this or is it still... When you're doing a conversion the, ad, it'll say you want to use an instant okay. experience. Yeah. Um, and we say yes. Um, it works okay. way better on mobile than on desktop. It's not really meant for desktop. Um, but more than half of people browsing on social media are now on mobile. So we target it to that. Yeah, that, that, that's another thing I want to ask you about. Um, are a lot of your clients doing a lot of their marketing efforts via mobile? It's about or 50, is it still 50. a combination that's of the, desktop That's the split that we see um, from yeah. purchasing as well. It depends on the brand that we're working with. Like some of the older brands, like the, the wine company that has older customers, uh, it's more 50-50. But as you get down to some of these newer startups that are targeting millennials and Gen Z, you start to see the numbers skew to even 65 to 70% mobile and, and 30% desktop. And now that Google is mobile first um, indexing, wow. like you should design everything for mobile. You should think about how it looks on mobile and then worry about desktop later uh, because it's that's what's going to impact your ranking the most. And that's where most people are going to be viewing and browsing your content. Gotcha. Well, that's good to know. And how recent was this change for um, Google? I'm pretty sure uh, they started doing rolling mobile it out indexing in like first. Um, I, I don't, they rolled it out slowly, but oh, now wow. I believe it's almost everyone. Like I have yet to see a client is Google search council that says that they're not mobile first indexing. Wow. Yeah. Cause that's one thing um, with my blog, it definitely looks a little bit different. It's still optimized for mobile, but it, I, I think I still okay, have so to change some things around to make it more optimized. Yeah. Cause it's a, looks, it looks a little funky. End on of 2016, <laughs> and by September, 2020, it's going to be default for all sites. So, wow. Yeah, okay. you got three months. So that'll right? definitely impact my SEO for sure. <laughs> Sounds good. I'll definitely got to make those changes. And then, okay. It's good to know. But yeah, but like um, this, this service, how I was able to connect with you, I actually uh, found this service, this radio guest mm -hmm. com, through the book that I was reading. Because the guy wrote a book, it was called Click Millionaires, and he's the author's name Scott Fox, and he made this server for um, for ra radio radio hosts and podcasters, and then the guest experts. So it's like it's where radio announcers and podcasters can meet their guests, and then they, and then they have a guest list, and then the guest, I don't know how he gets the guests, but well, yeah, like he puts all the guests on, and then. I've had so many people reach out to me for interviews because I want to get interviews, people, you know, interesting people on my podcast. And it's been crazy. Like this week, uh, since last week, I've really? had like seven to 10 requests. And this is all free. This is not like I'm not paying for the service. I just have to, mm -hmm. again, word of mouth advertising. I just have to do their hashtag on social. I just have to do the, men you know, mention them in the podcast. And yeah, and it's, 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 it's amazing. Because it would have taken me way longer, like you're saying about the influence thing, right? 
to try and find you like on social like that would have yeah. taken me way longer to try and find someone like you on social right like or or just to just through my content and stuff like that like it would, but like having it all on this database it's like it's amazing i was like blown away <laughs> so it's it's crazy the way things are going now and how we can um how we can leverage digital marketing to really build our personal brand and our and our lifestyle that we want. yeah it's 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 awesome my I love yeah. it, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and Brandon, yeah, how, I think, do you see I'm your last sure name as Amoroso? Pronounce it Amoroso, but how you say uh, it? My, my, but no, but I, I say I Amoroso. go back and forth. Oh, okay, actually, yeah, but, yeah. Um, it's kind of like the running joke amongst um, my, <laughs> my family and and some of our clients because uh, we we go back and forth. Like sometimes my dad will say it one way, and then sometimes I'll say it the other way, and frankly we really have no idea <laughs> that's awesome right on yeah cool cool um yeah what's some other questions i want to ask um let's see oh yeah um, this is one that yeah, Tim Ferriss says in his podcast a lot. Um, if you had a statement or a word, a single a word, what would it be? Statement. Yeah. Or a it could word. be a word or a statement. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of something that doesn't sound ridiculously cheesy or cliche. I don't know. A big thing <laughs> I've been thinking about recently yeah. is like just not focusing on the past other than to maybe learn from it. But once you've learned from it, like move on and, and focus on the future. Cause I find myself like I'm super type yeah. A and I try to make everything perfect. And so I can get paralyzed by, yeah, I guess this is yeah. segueing into two things. I can get paralyzed by like a, a minor mistake or issue in the past that like whatever, like let it go and learn from it and move on. But on the other hand, like I can get paralyzed by perfection and especially with like startups, yeah. it's more important just to, get shit done so maybe that'll be my statement is get shit done because yeah like i yeah. we've helped a lot of <laughs> yeah. our, especially yeah. when we work with startups who come from a design background like we could spend hours trying to perfect what the email looks like mm -hmm. but what is the lift going to be by changing the, the, the hue of the gray for the background on the email like very little nominal you could spend that time on far more productive things um, so there's like a whole different mentality you have to use when you're in a startup in that it's progress, not perfection. Um, so yeah, let's go with get shit done. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. And I've definitely, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. I've, uh, I can definitely relate to the perfection, perfectionist or perfectionism because I've really struggled with it for a long time myself. I'm definitely type A as well. And, um, but yeah, all of a sudden, these last few years, I've just been like, you know, I can still get sucked into it sometimes and, and overthink things and be like, oh, no, it's, I got to do it this way, this way. But lately, I've just been, I don't know, like, I just had this mental shift. And I've been talking to some people and getting varying perspectives more. And uh, yeah, and I, I would, I'd rather get in a millimeter of progress rather than, you yeah. know, like exactly. a meter of no progress. <laughs> so yeah yeah but yeah but uh i think that's i think that's all that i have today i, I might have more yeah. questions for you but uh really enjoyed having you on brandon uh well, amoroso, or amoroso however you say it <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah it was really awesome to have you on man and um yeah and then uh yeah if you if you know any anyone else that might be mm -hmm. might be interested uh, any colleagues or uh, associates you know that have a background in digital marketing or or uh or there, you know, other entrepreneurs that might be interested in getting their message out there, um, you know, their mission, sharing their story. I definitely, uh, definitely appreciate yeah, definitely. having you on. Um, and uh, and anyone else you know, that might be interested as well, let them know. In the future, um, always, always around. Oh no, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Really appreciate yeah, having you on, and uh, thanks again for uh, joining us on this episode. Talk to you later. Bye. All right. Yeah, you too, buddy. All right.